and uh, let's see what happens. And whenever if you want to join in at any point, please just join the fray and add your add your comments. Uh. Okay, so um, uh, first question is: Can Ajahn please explain further the three common words in many suttas: gratification, danger, and escape? This is the asada, adinava, and nisarana. There's the three words in Pali. Yeah. And um, uh, then uh, the second question is, what is the difference between causality and conditionality? Okay. So the, the three words that you are referring to, quite rightly, they are very common in the suttas. Uh, and it is a, a general kind of contemplation of uh, uh, these three characteristics, these are the characteristics uh, of our experience. Uh, yeah, we experience things as a, it has a gratification, in other words, it has an upside, uh, something that pleases us uh, about things. Uh, and then things have a downside, this is the adinava or the danger. Uh, and then you, when you weigh up the danger and the, kind of the good and the bad, uh, then you decide whether it's worth escaping or not, yeah, whether it kind of is a problem. Uh, so you do that with um, anything in life, uh, anything within on the path, uh, uh, sensual pleasures, uh, you do that with the five khandhas, you do it with the six sense bases, uh, and you <coughs> so you understand what the pleasure is in things. So for example, with uh, uh, the sense pleasures, yeah, you understand the kind of the happiness that comes from that, having a nice car, a nice house, all of these things, sense pleasures, always bring a degree of uh, uh, enjoyment, yeah. This is kind of why we are, why we like them. Otherwise, we wouldn't like them if they didn't bring any kind of happiness at all. Huh? So you s understand the happiness and the amount of happiness they can bring. Then you understand the danger that they are impermanent. That once you attach to them, they're going to be it's going to become painful. Huh? And that sense pleasures always end in pain. Huh? They may be happy for a while, but the end point is always problematic. Yeah? When you eventually pass away, everything has to go. Huh? So you understand the happiness, good part, you understand the danger, the problem, and then you understand that when you weigh the two up, uh, the problem is enormously much more greater than the ha benefit, uh, uh, because uh, it, it kind of carries on forever pretty much. Uh, and then you look for the escape, uh, yeah, because you understand that there is a problem with these things. Uh. So that is the, uh, adi the asada, adinava and nisarana, uh, benefit uh, and uh, danger and escape. Uh. So, uh, and uh, the in interesting in the sutta, as the Buddha always says, that he understands all of those three, uh, and uh, that is part of what it means to be awakened, basically, that uh, having that balanced understanding of these things. Uh. Uh, the second question is about conditionality and causality, and uh, the difference between them as they are used in English and as they are used in uh, kind of Buddhist circles. In Buddhist circles, they are used almost often as synonymous. Uh, there isn't that much difference in them, but uh, the difference usually would be that if something is a causal process, uh, if one thing causes something else, it means that it is a necessary condition. Uh, a condition that has to be there, yeah? It's necessary and sufficient. It gives rise to the next one, it is a cause. Uh, once it is in place, the next thing has to happen as a consequence. Uh, but conditionality is often more, a bit more, uh, not as strong. Uh, a condition can be in something that influences some, something else, uh, but it may not actually cause it. Uh, yeah, so uh, you, there may be many things that are required for something to happen, uh, uh, but the, uh, it may not be a cause. So for example, if you are going to light a fire, you need a number of things. You need a fuel and you need, need a flame. You have to have both of those for the fire to light. Uh, so uh, the fuel is a condition, it is a requirement, uh, but it may not, be, isn't, may not be enough for there to be a flame. It may not be a cause. Uh, the cause could perhaps said to be a spark, yeah, which ignites the whole thing. That could be said to be a cause, because once you have the fuel, then you get the cause, the spark, then you have to have a, a fire as a consequence. Uh. So uh, there is a little bit of difference there, but in Buddhism we often kind of treat these things almost as if they are syn synonymous. Uh. Uh, but causality is, in many ways, the more interesting one. Uh, in like independent origination, for example, uh, if you say that avijja pachaya sankara, the word pachaya there means uh, causality, not just conditionality, but causality. Once you have avijja, you have to have sankaras. Once you have delusion, you have to have these volitions and the will that uh, 
creates kamma. Yeah, these things are uh, are necessary. One thing uh, uh, implies the other one. Uh, once you have a sankara, you have to have inyana. Yeah. So that so because of all of these um, links in uh, dependent origination, one causes the next one. There's only one th way to get out of it, and that is to undermine the avidja at the beginning and make the avidja into vidja. Once you have the insight, then the whole thing also comes apart. Uh, yeah. So causa causality and conditionality here. Uh. Causality is the more interesting one for that reason here. Uh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, people happy with that? Uh? Unhappy with that? Uh? Yeah, neutral? <laughs> yeah. Causality is more important in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. More fundamental, yeah. Condition is, then, you know, it comes after cause. Comes after cause. It comes. Uh, a condition is um, a thing which influences something else. Yeah. So condition yeah. is something that um, may have an influence, but may not, may not have a very, um, may not actually have a be a causal factor. But maybe, for example, it may be. Um, uh, how can we uh, 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 to take? If, if you eat something, yeah, the salt. If you add a bit of salt to the food, it's going to be conditioned for the taste, uh, but it's not going to cause the taste. It will have a taste even without so without salt. Uh, so maybe something that has an influence on something. Uh, it may change the feeling. For example, sankara may be. Uh, let's say, uh, what is a good um, question? The uh, uh, passa is the cause for vedana. Uh, but uh, you don't know what exactly what Vedana is going to come out of that, uh, that Passa, depending on many different causes. Uh, uh, the Vedana will vary depending on the kind of Passa you have. Uh, yeah, so there is other conditions coming together. It's not just Passa, there's the kind of Passa you have and, uh, and other factors that determine the Vedana you have as a consequence. So con conditions, they have an influence, uh, but they uh, may not be the thing that actually make it happen. Uh. Right. Something like that? Uh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that, I, I just wanted to ask you, bef before I was talking about the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta and uh, Mara talking to the Buddha and all these kind of things, uh, do you think, wh what do you think about these kind of ideas in a uh, in, in more traditional Buddhist context like Thailand? Is it gonna, are people going to think that I'm a really bad monk for saying these kind of things or, or do people talk, ha have these kind of ideas in, in Thailand as well? Huh? What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> do you, have, do you, have, you don't have to answer if you don't want to uh, answer. Yeah, but I, uh, I don't know. It depends on uh, you know. Depends on the teacher. So if different you are teacher yeah. will have probably different look at different aspect of. Yeah. But I'm not really. I'm not into this kind of <laughs> thing. <story>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, good. Yeah. So, cook, Venerable Cookrit, he might agree with me. Is that what you reckon? Because he's more, uh, he's more kind of. Uh, is that what he meant? For, exa <laughs> for example, uh, as an example. Uh, uh, who? Venerable Cookrit. Yeah. Cookrit. Yeah. No, he. This is not uh, the Buddha's word. Yeah. So he have no yeah. opinions about. N no opinions other, about other other stuff. Okay. Yeah. Only the Buddha's word he Yeah. Well this might be he might consider this the Buddha's word, you know, because in that sutta it says that it? the Buddha said this. Uh, so he might he might see it as the Buddha's word. I don't know what he would uh, anyway. <laughs> Never mind. Let's let's leave it at that. Uh, okay. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, dear Ajahn, is there any parallel in the Chinese Agamas that suggests that the Buddha has told the Venerable Ananda three times that he can live on for the eon, but the Venerable Ananda couldn't get uh, this message, Sadhu times three. Um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I cannot really remember because I haven't, I cannot remember all the parallels to all the suttas and all these things. I, I think it may be in there and I don't actually know all the parallels as well. Uh, there are about, I think, three parallels in the Chinese Agamas to the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So they, they remember the Chinese Agamas are not are quite different from the Pali Nikayas uh, because the Pali Nikayas are from one school of Buddhism uh, whereas the Chinese Agamas are a, 
a compilation of suttas from various kind of schools. It's a very different kind of literature here. So there you have three versions of the Mahapanibbana Sutta, probably coming from different schools, yeah, and all kind of things. Uh, and that is kind of makes them very interesting, but it also is a lot of work to translate all of that. And I, because I can't, cannot read Chinese characters, I would have loved to read Chinese characters, but I, I can't. Uh, uh, I cannot really, I, have, I'm, I rely on translations. Uh, and I think the one translation that is available into English from the Chinese, uh, I think it has a similar kind of uh, uh, thing there as the, uh, um, uh, as the Pali has. Uh, but uh, sometimes, even though all the various parallels have the same thing, uh, still it is not, not necessarily the case that it is original. Yeah, it is more likely, uh, but it doesn't mean that it is absolutely original just because uh, all the various versions have the same thing. Uh, uh, because uh, the versions, uh, the various schools, they only started to separate a time around the time of Ashoka. Ashoka came, was a, came around about 150 years after the Buddha, that's when the schools started to separate. Uh, but there may have been changes uh, before that, yeah, and those changes that happened before that, uh, they will very likely be part of all the various schools. Uh. So the idea of uh, whether it is there in the parallel versions is only one criteria uh, by which we can decide whether something is early or not. Uh. But it's not the only criteria. Another one would be what you call internal consistency. Uh. And this, in my in this case, I would say it is not internally consistent, because on the one hand, the Buddha is almost about to pass away because he's old, out of all age. On the other hand, you have this other story, so it makes you wonder which one is true. And to me, always the, the natural principles uh, have to have precedence before the supernatural principles. Uh, so if there is a natural principle that already explains it sufficiently, there's no need to invoke this kind of supernatural uh, ideas. Uh, so I tend to fall because, and, and, and I say that because there is a clear tendency in the various Buddha schools to add supernatural principles, uh, after, especially after the time of the Buddha. You can see that the later the literature is, uh, the more supernatural principles you have. Uh, you go to the Mahayana literature and you read some of the suttas there, like the Prajna Paramita Sutta, which is a very fundamental uh, sutta in the Mahayana literature, it starts off with ten pages on all kind of miraculous and marvelous things. Uh, yeah? it's a you can feel it has a kind of later flavor to it. Uh, the later you go, the more flowery and, and kind of marvelous and wonderful everything is. Uh, and this is one of those tendencies you see here. Uh. So I'm, I'm not saying this comp without reason, but, I, but there are various reasons that you can use to make decisions on, on these things. Uh, uh, but um, uh, yeah, but again, there is a degree of uncertainty there. I'm just kind of, this is just the way it seems to me. Uh, and of course, there isn't any uh, absolute way of knowing, but that's my kind of feeling about that. Uh. If you're not happy with my answer, or you want to, you know, come back with uh, an answer, a second question, you are very welcome to do so. Uh, yeah, you don't have to accept my answer as final, anything like that. Uh, you're very welcome to question further here. Uh. So, uh, Okay, if I'm wrong, it's really good, because if I'm wrong, then I have learned something, yeah? If, I'm, if I sit here and nobody challenges me, I'm I feel like I'm always right. Uh, after a while, I might get conceited, I'm always right. So, so, <laughs> so please challenge me if you want to. <laughs> okay, next one. Oh, this is a two-page two -page question, okay. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, uh, reference to recollection of the Tathagata. A few years ago, I had a major surgery and was given morphine as pain management. After two shots of self-administering morphine, I felt very nauseated. Uh, thereafter, I stopped the morphine and I chanted it so until I fell asleep. Uh, I didn't suffer uncontrollable pain when I was chanting and I didn't need the morphine at all. The pain management team were shocked that I only used two shots of morphine after the surgery. Uh, I'm not sure if my mind went into some sort of samadhi or if I was the power of the Buddha, but I definitely went to the Buddha for <laughs> refuge uh, and completely surrendered. Perhaps Ajahn has some advice. <laughs> Thank you. That's, very, that's a nice, very nice story. Uh, and uh, it's a you know, wonderful thing to be able to do. You don't have to use morphine, you just use the, uh, the Itipiso chant. That's really, uh, that's very nice. Uh, it's uh, very hard to say what is, um, what is happening there, but uh, you know, sometimes if you have uh, 
faith in something, uh, uh, sometimes the faith in itself can also be very powerful. Uh, and uh, sometimes you have like the placebo effect, it's a very well-known effect in modern medicine. Uh, and uh, sometimes this effect can be small, it can be large, depending on the situation. Uh, but the placebo effect is basically the idea that if you are given, you know, you have two pills, one is a real medicine, one is just a sugar pill. Uh, but even if you get the sugar pill, it's better than nothing. Uh, yeah, you eat a sugar pill and you feel better as a consequence. That is called the placebo effect, uh, because you get something uh, and that kind of alleviates the symptoms. Uh, and even if you know it is a placebo, you know it is just a sugar pill, still it works. Uh, yeah? <laughs> this is kind of the strange thing about this. So uh, the itipiso, at the very least, it would have a, uh, often a placebo effect. You feel good, you know this is the teaching of the Buddha, you feel kind of, you know, you're getting some kind of a support simply by having that refuge, simply by knowing that there is something in your life that supports you, is often enough to give you a mental boost. Uh, so this is kind of accepted by modern medicine. There's no need to kind of ask for supernatural powers. Uh, on top of that, it may be that uh, at this time you kind of you knew that you needed some support, so maybe you focused particularly strongly on this, uh, and you, as you say, you used it as a refuge, uh, so maybe you were able to focus so much that actually the pain kind of disappeared. Uh, I don't really know, I mean, it's hard for me to say based on the information you give, but something like that may very well have happened. Uh, so, um, either, wa either one of those explanations. Is there anything beyond that? Uh, I don't know, uh, I, uh, maybe not, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, uh, I think that is probably enough, really, to uh, to to uh, explain it. Uh, I don't think was it the power of the Buddha. Uh, well, the, it's just the power of the chanting, the power of the Dhamma. I would say, if anything, I mean, the Buddha is dead, so he can't really do very much. But it could be like the the residue, perhaps, the re remainder of that, in the sense of the Dhamma still being around, and then taking, as you say, refuge in that. Uh, so it's a very nice story. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, and these are the sort of things that you uh, sometimes you can do. You can kind of uh, get out of these things. Uh, I remember Ajahn Brahm also tells the story when he had a toothache. He had a very, very bad toothache. Uh, uh, many years ago, you may have heard that story. And he, and he was also trying to chant. It didn't work for him. He was chanting away. He was almost standing on his head trying to chant. And it still didn't have any effect. Uh, and then eventually he just... Uh, decided, okay, well, I, I can't, there's nothing I can do, I just have to let go. So he just sat down and he decided not to have any desire anymore for the pain to stop. And then as he let go of desire completely, bang, it just disappeared. So again, it shows you that a lot of the problem with pain is in the mind. It's created by the mind. Let go of the mental part and just, as you say here, surrender completely, and maybe that's what you did. Then uh, the pain can uh, disappear as a consequence. Uh, the resistance yeah. will cause the pain. When Absolutely, yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's like the, uh, the two darts, yeah, in the suit of the two darts. Uh, so the pain dart and then the mental dart. Uh, and the resistance is like the, uh, the mental dart. Uh, so you let go of that and you have, uh, sometimes you, the, you realize that the physical dart was actually very small to begin with. It wasn't a big problem. The biggest problem was the, the mind, indeed. Uh, Okay. Dear uh, Ajahn, in Sanghita Nikaya 46.3, uh, Ethics Sutta, page 116, paragraphs 2, 3, and 8, starts with, at such a time a mendicant has activated the awakening power of mindfulness, etc. What is meant by at such a time? Uh, and it means like at any time when you do this, that's what it means, yeah? At such a time when a mendicant, maybe something is missing there, just ref referring to it, whenever you do this, this is what happens. So, so um, uh, and usually the awakening power of mindfulness or, or um, awakening factor of mindfulness is, uh, you, it's hard to, is it during meditation or outside of meditation? It, it ca it's difficult to do it outside of meditation because uh, at this point your mindfulness is becoming very strong when it becomes uh, uh, an awakening factor of mindfulness, yeah? And it's not really, it's very difficult to uphold that kind of mindfulness outside of meditation. It's the sort of thing that happens when you sit down, you're watching your breath continuously and it's not really skipping, skipping too much, uh, yeah? 
that is really the sort of mindfulness that is meant here. And this is quite a developed kind of mindfulness. Uh, very hard to keep up that kind of mindfulness outside of meditation. Uh, the kind of mindfulness you want outside of meditation is sufficient mindfulness to be aware of what is going on in your mind. Uh, if you can have enough mindfulness for that, uh, because then you can start to regulate your behavior. You can see that ill will is about to arise or desire is about to arise, too much desire, whatever it is, and then you can move in a different direction. You can change your perception, yeah, and these sort of things. Uh, and that is the kind of mindfulness you want in ordinary life. Just sufficient uh, to know what is going on. Uh. And that is quite hard already. Sometimes, yeah, to really, to always, you know, catch your mind sufficiently to be able to catch the anger is about to, upset is about to arise. Okay, stop, don't want to go there. And then you refocus in a different way. Uh. But if you can do that, wow, then already you have, re that's already really good. And that because then you have the possibility of managing your mind and having this thing that we call sense restraint uh, as a conse consequence. Uh. Otherwise you are at the mercy of the world around you, uh, which is not so nice or useful. Uh. Okay. Dear Arjan, in what way is the sense restraint mentioned in the Kundalya Sutta different from the Bahya's teaching? In the seen, there is only the seen, etc. Um, the uh, Bahya's teaching is much more profound. The Bahya's teaching is the idea that when you uh, see something, there is no uh, self-reference, there is no identity, there is nothing, you don't make anything out of it, uh, you don't have any papancha, and yeah, that's what is meant here. Papancha is the idea when you uh, pro proliferate. Uh, and, uh, so, and this kind of proliferation uh, can often be very, very subtle, uh, that you refer to it somehow, uh, refer to it to you, yeah, this is my vision, or you perceive it as being yours, or something like that. Uh, it can be very, very subtle. It can have to do with views. It can have to do with uh, uh, the conceit I am or whatever. Uh, so it's more, it's more primary. The, the, the uh, defilement that we're talking about here in the um, Kundalya Sutta is more developed. Uh, yeah? First of all, you think that you might get hold of this. It might be yours. You relate to it somehow. And then the desire becomes quite strong. Uh, so one is a much more subtle thing than the other one. Uh, and the one in the Bahya Sutta is really the, the, a sort of thing that comes from very profound insight into seeing non-self of things. Uh, whereas the other one is a much more preliminary practice of calming down the defilements to a certain extent. Uh, and then from that, then you can have the kind of insight uh, that they talk about in the Bahya Sutta. Uh, one is more preliminary, one is more profound. Uh, one has to do with the very idea I am, the conceit I am, uh, the other one has more to do with managing your emotions in daily life. Uh, but you're right, they are related to each other, uh, uh, especially because when you uh, deal, take away the whole conceit I am, of course you're also dealing with uh, the, sense, the senses as well. Uh. I was under impression that bias teaching is not something easily doable. Well, exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, not at all. According to an article from Ajahn Brahm, one must have access to jhana to practice bias teachings. Absolutely, because uh, it is about seeing non-self and all of that. Uh, so you really need to have the, the jhanas to do that. Uh, so I think that is uh, exactly right, what you're saying there. Uh, and so these things are not, not the same. And um, there is some uncertainty anyway. The Bahya's teaching is found in the Udana. There's also a similar one, a similar sutta found somewhere in the Sanyutta Nikaya, I think. Uh, and the uh, Udana, the, uh, uh, if you do a comparative study of the Udana, there is a, a Chinese version of the Udana, there is a Pali version, and they are quite different. One of the differences is that the, the verses, yeah, the Udana is made of a verse, and then there is like a prose section before the verse. And the verses are often quite similar, but the prose section in front is very different in the Udana. So the verse section seems to be more original, uh, whereas the prose may in many cases be stories that have been added later. Uh, which is a bit of a shame because those stories are really nice. Uh, yeah? Some of the stories are really kind of uh, uh, interesting so stories. Uh, sometimes the best things are not, not original. Uh, yeah? Many people you want to read all the stories in the Jatakas and the, uh, and, and the uh, Dhammapada Atakas. Some of the stories are really nice. Uh, and then someone tells you it didn't come from the Buddha and then you feel really let down afterwards. Uh. <laughs> uh, 
It's very, very common. Well, especially if you grow up in a Buddhist country like Thailand or, or Sri Lanka, you're grown up in a Buddhist culture. Uh, and many of the things that you learn in the Buddhist culture has got nothing to do with the Buddhist teachings. Uh, you learn all this other stuff, uh, yeah, all the kind of things that have nothing to do. You, you learn the Vasanta Rajatika and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, very nice stories, but nothing to do with Buddhism, uh, more to do with Brahmanism and, uh, and, and that sort of thing that has to do with Buddhism. Uh, and then they come and oh, but the Buddha said, no, actually he didn't say that at all. This is just, uh, oh, I was taught this because I grew up in a Buddhist country. Well, you don't really learn Dhamma very often when you grow up in a Buddhist country. What you learn is, you <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? What you learn is what the Buddhist culture has kind of brought to the front over many, many centuries and millennia, and these have become kind of what Buddhism has become. Uh, but that doesn't mean that necessarily you know all that much about the early uh, Buddhist teachings. Uh, and this is kind of interesting, yeah. and uh, this is so, such a common thing uh, across the Buddhist world uh, and uh, everywhere, uh, that people are more, have more knowledge and understanding about later Buddhism than the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, anyway, so, um, let's go on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, I know anger is a defilement and uh, uh, how it strains relationships at a time can be unkind. How do I gradually train myself to have a better temper and not to outburst my negative emotions? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so this is what we talked about during the uh, a retreat time. I was talking about that sutta. It's actually in the book. So if you have the book, look at the sutta that is called the uh, uh, removing of resentment, or something like that. Uh, yeah, sutta. And uh, uh, and that is a very nice sutta that tells shows you a lot about how to avoid anger. Uh, and uh, I will uh, give you a couple of quick uh, ideas, which are straight from the sutta, to maybe to help you understand the sutta a little bit better. Uh, uh, one of the main ways of getting uh, removing anger is to remember uh, the good qualities in people around you. Uh, yeah, and uh, very often you find that temper may very well, very often is related to certain people. There are certain people that trigger your temper more than others. Uh, yeah, it's always a bit like that. Uh, certain people we find more difficult. Uh, so start with those people you find find difficult. Uh, and then, uh, uh, especially if they are part of the BGF uh, or they are a good Buddhist or whatever, it's quite easy to see the good qualities in, in those people. Yeah, they come here, they want to be kind, they want to do the right thing. Yeah. And straight away, if somebody wants to do the right thing already, they are worthy of a lot of praise. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. So you build that up in your mind, you remind yourself of that. Uh, and the more you build that up, uh, the next time they do something which, is, which irritates you, you remember that actually they have so many good qualities and then your temper dies down, bang, very fast again. Uh. The quicker you remember that, uh, the quicker your temper dies down as a consequence. Uh. This is one way, yeah, remembering the good qualities in people around you, building that up. Uh. And the other one, if there is someone who cannot see many good qualities in, then you have to have compassion instead. Uh. So you remember that someone who has all bad qualities, uh, you remember that they are their own worst enemy. Uh. Yeah, if you have really lots of bad qualities, you are, you, you are a terrible enemy to yourself uh, because you're creating so much bad karma, because you're creating so much uh, disharmony in your life, so many problems in your life. Uh. And then instead of getting upset with them, uh, you can have compassion with them. Uh, because they are the ones who suffer much more than you do because of their own stupidity. Uh, yeah, they are blind, they are deluded, they don't, don't know what they are doing. Uh, so when you look at them, you don't think about your pain or your problem anymore with them. Uh, you look at them and, and you, you start to feel a bit sorry for them. Gee, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, yeah, you're blind, you have all this, all this, you know, doing all these crazy things. Uh, and it's, you are going to hurt the most. Uh, and then you have a sense of compassion instead. Uh. So those two together covers all people. Either the person has some good qualities and you can look at those uh, and neutralize the anger through that. Uh. If they haven't got any good qualities, uh, then you look at the uh, side of compassion. Uh. So have a look at that sutta. That sutta has some beautiful similes to help that uh, idea, kind of strengthen that idea. And uh, uh, then you have a very good foundation for overcoming ill will and anger. Uh. Uh, it's not that hard to overcome ill will, at least to some extent. Uh, and um, th this is one of the really great ways of doing that. Uh, remember that people are, have no self. Uh, yeah, from Buddhist point of view, they have nothing 
inside of them that is a rudder that is always driving them in the right direction uh, because they don't have that self because they don't have that because they're always conditioned uh, and and uh, they are the sum of all the quali all the things that work on them uh, because of that uh, you cannot really blame people for doing stupid things uh, people do something stupid uh, what do you expect they're conditioned to do that they can't do anything different uh, and there's something beautiful about that because it means that you know that everyone is the victim of that conditioning that they have uh, and they can't really be any, any different. Uh, compassion comes in very quickly here. Yeah. Okay. So, we have a few more questions. Uh, dear Arjan, for a one returner or a seven returner, where the, that's the stream entry, where the rebirth takes place, must it be in the human realm? Uh, what about non-returner? And uh, where the perfection, the, where does the perfection to Arahant take place? When or where? Where, where did the perfection of Arahant Okay, so let's start with uh, this. So the, the ones returner, they say that, uh, it says that they, re obviously re they return once, and the question is, where is it that they return once? And according to the standard explanation, they turn once to the sensual realm. And the sensual realm is very vast. Uh, it can be any kind of heavenly realm within the sensual realm. Uh, that is where they come back. Yeah. Uh, so that is the once return. Yeah? The uh, stream entry, uh, which you call here the seven times returner, because that's the maximum number of uh, returns you can have as a stream entry, it can take place in many any kind of anywhere also within the se within, within the se sensual realm. Uh, you don't know. There is some one of the stream enters called the Eka Biji. Uh, uh, Biji is um, like a seed, uh, the one seeder, uh, the one that comes back once, uh, and they are said to come back once to the human realm. Uh, yes, yeah, so you come back once to the human realm, and then you make uh, an end of suffering from there. Uh, uh, the seven times returner, uh, there isn't. It, ha it isn't clearly defined exactly where you get reborn, uh, but presumably it is uh, within the sensual realm seven times at the most. Uh, because once you go to the Brahma realm, uh, then you can never come back again if you are a stream enter. Once you get re reborn in the Brahma realm, you are on the way out of here. Uh. It is called the uh, Jan Anagami. Uh, Jan Anagami is the non Jana non-returner. So once you have a stream ender and you get reborn Brahma Loka, you are a Jan Anagami, can never come back again. So that means it has to be within the sensual realm. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the kind of usual way of understanding this. Um, uh, what about the non-returner? Non-returner must go to the straight to the Jana realms. It can never come back to the sensual realm at all. Yeah? Any of the sensual heavens, all of that is out, uh, and you get reborn in the Brahma Loka, which is the uh, Jana realms. Uh, according to this is the standard Buddhist understanding of these things. Uh, where the perfection to Arahant takes place, perfection to Arahant can take place uh, uh, you presumably, maybe you mean for the non-returner, uh, and for the non-returner, uh, it then takes place in the jhana realms. Yeah, if you if you go into a jhana realm, uh, and you are already a stream and or non-returner, the moment you come out of the jhana, bang, arahant, and you got you're out of here, and that's you're, you're finished, uh, and that's kind of arahantship. Uh, um, uh, but apart from that, it's interesting that arahant, you can become an arahant in many different places. Uh, you can become an arahant as a human being, uh, you can be a deva, and you can, it seems like you can become an arahant as a deva as well. Uh, yeah, so devas, you can maybe have arahant devas. Uh, and uh, so these uh, states of perfection, remember the Buddha is teacher of gods and humans, uh, yeah? So gods are also included. Uh, so you can kind of uh, you know, hang out in the uh, Devaloka, and uh, the Buddha comes and gives you a nice teaching. Yeah, one of the nice things about the Devaloka, which people often miss or underestimate, rather, is that um, in the Devaloka there probably are a lot of Aryas up there. Because where do the Aryas get reborn? Well, the pure people get reborn in the Devaloka. Huh? So Aryas, yeah, there's going to be a lot of Aryas. Huh? Yeah, a lot of noble people up there. Huh? That's kind of nice, isn't it? Huh? go up and you kind of hang out with all the noble ones, the stream enterers and all these kind of things. Uh, much more likely to be there than in the human realm. Uh, human realms, we are, we are a bunch of scallywags compared to the devas. Uh, <laughs> it's more unlikely to find any, any kind of really special people here. Uh. 
Turn left. <laughs> no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong way. Eightfold path. Eightfold path. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, sometimes eightfold path is left. That's true. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So I hope you are happy with that. Uh, and um, next one. Next two. Venerable uh, Ajahn, this morning your explanation of the uh, uh, Satta Bojanga awakening factors uh, uh, at investigation of Dhamma, one abides within the fourth jhana, or one actually has to come out from the fourth jhana in order to investigate the Dhamma, Sahara times three. Um, the, uh, the investigation of the Dhamma is long before you. Uh, get to the jhana states. Uh, yeah, you have remember there's a sequence here. Uh, so you start off with the sati sambhojanga. This is the mindfulness. This is like the watching the breath uh, or any kind of the satipatthana practices. Uh, yeah, or the reflection on the dhamma or, or and all of these kind of things. Uh, then you have the investigation of dhamma. After that, so and the investigation of dhamma in this case is. Uh, Either it is just a reflection on the teaching, uh, and because you reflect on the teaching, you get the energy and the rapture and all of that arising from that. Yeah, or the reflection on the teaching can be like the Satipatthana Sutta, where you understand the defilements of the mind, and because you understand them, you abandon them. You need to understand them to be able to abandon them, and this is what is happening in Dhammavichaya. You uh, tr you start to understand what is going on. Uh, and then, based on that, uh, then you go through this whole sequence until you reach Samadhi and the fourth jhana. So it is these things are opposite ends of the Bojangas, uh, and you have to go through the whole sequence. Um, uh, virya, energy, piti, uh, joy and rapture, pasadi, tranquility, then Samadhi. Yeah? It's a long way up. Uh, and then from Samadhi you go to the fourth jhana, which is Upeka. And, uh, as you do this, the whole process is one of both samatha and vipassana, because for every stage that you move up the sequence, uh, you feel both more calm uh, and you have more clarity, more clear seeing. Uh, so this whole process, and uh, often this process may not go all the way to the end, it's actually very rare that it goes all the way to the end, uh, uh, and every time you come out of that process, the meditation doesn't, doesn't go any deeper, and then you reflect back, like we were talking about in the Anapanasati Sutta, you reflect back on that process, and that is often where you can have some more profound insight into what is going on. Uh, if you get to the fourth jhana, after you come out of the fourth jhana, its insight almost happens to you. It's almost like you have no choice, it just bang, and you gain these insights. Uh, you don't really have to steer your mind all that much because you already have the right view, uh, you already have the power of the samadhi, and the two together is like a, is like a, a match and a kind of fuel, bang, coming together, and then you get the explosion, which is like insight. Uh, this is like a, a simile for the insight. Uh. And this is one of those fascinating things, you know, the Noble Eightfold Path ends uh, with the jhanas, uh, the bhujangas uh, end with upeka, upeka means literally looking on. So when you get to this point, you are looking on. Yeah, you have the mind which is very even, and all you do is look. The st very, very steady mind, and then when you, as you look, uh, this whole thing just opens up for you, and you understand what is going on. Uh, you've just been through a process, uh, and that because you've just been through it, uh, it is very clear in your memory, and you see how that process works. Uh, the abandoning of things, the giving up of things, so that you can enter the jhanas, and then you see impermanence, you see suffering, uh, you see how this whole thing is non-self, uh, and gone. So this is uh, how you do it. I know that in many uh, s many kind of traditions they teach that after jhana you have to kind of you know go into insight and all of this. But uh, uh, if you are if you practice this in the right way, you don't actually have to do very much after a jhana state. Uh, you can just sit back and, uh, and just reflect on what has happened, and then this happens almost automatically, and then the insight sort of just comes by itself pretty much. Uh, uh, and this is kind of what you see in the suttas. Uh, if you want to have more insight before the jhanas, or more understanding, then you may have to direct the mind a little bit more, uh, because until you have the jhanas, the mind is not as steady, so you need more direction to pinpoint it, perhaps. Uh, but after jhana, it's just, uh, these things just happen. Uh. 
You can't avoid it. You ha must have insight after jhana. Yeah. Is that good? Huh? I <coughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty easy. Yeah, this is kind of the nice thing about it. It just everything just happens. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Next one. Venerable Ajahn, can you please explain the difference between Chaito Vimuti and Panya Vimuti? Uh, is there a difference in the practice that leads to different types of liberation? Thank you, Saru times three. Uh, Chaito Vimuti means liberation of mind. Chaito is mind. Panya Vimuti, uh, Panya means wisdom, so that's liberation by wisdom. And uh, the difference is that uh, a chet, it depends on the context in which they are used. Uh, but cheto vimutti can, for example, be a state of samadhi. If you come out of a jhana state or you come out of a brahma vihara, brahma viharas are called cheto vimuttis. Uh, and they are cheto vimuttis because the mind is liberated from the hindrances, uh, liberated from those negative states. Uh, that's why you are liberated. But it is a temporary liberation, right? Because uh, samadhi is temporary, it's not a final liberation. Huh? So that is the one, of the one of the meanings of cheta vimu cheta vimuti. Panya vimuti means liberation through wisdom. Huh? And this means when the, uh, uh, you have seen uh, reality fully, and of course then there is no return back again. Huh? It is a final uh, liberation. Huh? But sometimes, very often, Panya Vimutti and Cheta Vimutti are used together. Uh, they are used kind of as a pair. So when you become an Arahant, it is often said you have both Cheta Vimutti and Panya Vimutti when you become an Arahant. Uh, and that is because both of these liberations come together. Uh, you are both liberated uh, from the, uh, fr from the um, defilements, uh, just in the same way as you are liberated through a jhana state, uh, but you also uh, liberated through the insight or understanding so that those defilements can never come back again. Uh, it is both a liberation of mind in the sense that the mind feels free, but it's, uh, so you, you, know, you feel the freedom that comes from that liberation, but it's also an insight at the same time so that there is no returning back, yeah, if you see what I mean. And then the, those two things coming together, that means that you, you, know, uh, you both feel good and there's no turning back at the same time. Yeah. Uh, there is something also called the uh, uh, Upatubhaga Vimutti as well. And this means liberated in both ways. Uh, and that refers to the fact that you are, not only do you have the Panya Vimutti, the full liberation of the Arahant, uh, but you also have the, uh, the uh, immaterial attainments as well. Uh, Upatubhaga Vimutti means that you um, have access to the very high states of uh, liberation of samadhi that are beyond the four jhanas. Uh, yeah? That's what it means, the Ubhata Bhagavad Muti. So this is um, uh, when you have, uh, you're an arahant, but you have extra samadhi on top of what is required for arahantship. Uh. Empty! Yay! <laughs> That's good news, isn't it? Emptiness is always the best according to Buddhism. Uh. <laughs> is there any... Uh, <laughs> Any more questions or anything anyone would like to add? Or is everyone exhausted? Huh? Yes, Barbara, okay. Do we have a uh, microphone for her? Huh? At the back, at the very back there huh, is a microphone, yeah. To aspire to be a Buddha? By bypass the Arahant Buddha? It is not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being blunt because uh, there is no path to Buddhahood. There is no path. There is only one path in the suttas, and that path is the path to Arahantship. So to become a Buddha is like a random thing. It just happens occasionally to occasional people, but there is no path to go there. The idea of a path to Buddhahood is a later development uh, that came in the commentaries and came in Mahayana Buddhism. So it is not actually laid down by the Buddha. And because it isn't laid down by the Buddha, who has the authority to lay down the path to Buddhahood? If the Buddha didn't do it, uh, nobody has that authority. Yeah? And there's some kind of anonymous person decided we need a path to, Ara to Buddhahood, uh, but actually there, there is no one with that authority. So, so uh, it is not uh, advisable to become a Bodhisattva and to aim for Buddhahood. Uh, Arahantship is, uh, is really the only way here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyone else want to say anything? Uh, yes. Venable, yeah. <laughs> I'm still trying to follow up with your the chanting. Okay. <laughs> the morning and evening yeah. chanting. Yeah. I went to uh, Pai Kiwi mm. in San Francisco mm. and also uh, Amaravati mm. in UK. Sure. They, yeah. they, they chant. Absolutely, yes. Morning and yeah. evening chanting. How come at the Bodhiyana? <laughs> what make a Jan Brahm different? <laughs> oh, but, uh, because uh, the, the reason they do it is because uh, that was the practice at Wat Papong in Thailand. Uh -huh. So in Ajahn Shah's monasteries, they always did this, uh, yeah? yeah? So they just follow along. They, kind of, they are like the white sheep, bah, and they follow along and just do exactly the same thing. Yeah? <laughs> we are the black sheep, uh, yeah? <laughs> so we are the black sheep. We think for ourselves. We don't just follow along blindly. Uh. And what is, what is interesting is that in the Thai forest tradition, the only place really where, I think, as far as I know, where it was common to do morning and evening chanting was in Ajahn Shah's monastery. I think in the Dhammayut monasteries, uh, they didn't do that. Uh, so if you go to the Dhammayut forest monasteries, which were, there were more Dhammayut forest monasteries than Mahanikaya forest monasteries. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to that, they didn't actually do this. This was a speciality of uh, Lumpur Cha, and it was not something that you found in the other monasteries. Uh, so there is no, you know, you don't have a, just because you are Ajahn Shah's disciple doesn't mean that you have to follow exactly the same way. Uh, and so we, so that's why we do these things uh, slightly differently. And one of the reasons is because uh, Ajahn Brahm is into solitude. Uh, he loves solitude. Uh, and he always says that the best meditation is to be had in solitude. Uh, so there's no need to kind of meet together and sit together in groups. Uh, you sit in your kuti. That's the best place to do meditation practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, is there a microphone for him? Uh, okay, from Venerable over here. Yeah. I think you turned it off. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, Ajahn, okay. uh, yeah. uh, um, if one has jhana, uh, does it guarantee that af uh, after they are passing away, does that mean they are going to Brahma Loka or they can come back to Kama Loka if they have experience uh, jhana. of jhana? Uh, it's not enough to have experience of jhana. You have to have a steady uh, experience. Uh, yeah, so you have to have a regular experience where you have access to the jhana. So even if you have attained it once or twice or ten times, it's not enough. You have to have that habit, ability to re-enter it at will pretty much. So it says, that's what it says in the sutta. So once you are really experienced with the jhanas, that means that when you die, you can enter the jhana easily and you get reborn in those realms. Ah, oh, okay. That yeah. explains. Because I, I was yeah. w wondering when you mentioned that uh, when the Sotapanna, when they die, they sh according to Ajahn's uh, previous comments, that they should have yeah. at least jhana experience before they can become a Sotapanna or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. I was wondering if that's the case, why don't every yeah. Sotapanna become uh, yeah. Janagami? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, that explains. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Uh, I, is everyone exhausted? Uh, <laughs> no, some, some, are, some are not. Okay. Okay, so no more questions? Uh, okay. Uh, oh, one at the back there. Yeah, please. Uh, you have to. Who is Mara or what is Mara? I, it's okay, okay I, will rep I will repeat it for the recordings. That's okay. Who is Mara or what is Mara? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, because uh, it is far from obvious from the suttas uh, what the answer to that is, but generally speaking, the most common way that Mara is used in the suttas is used as a psychological principle. So Mara is whatever kind of scares you or makes it difficult or it is a defilement that arises in the mind. This is called Mara. So you can say that you know, if you meditate and uh, you have something arising which blocks you in the meditation, you could say it's Mara that is disturbing you, yeah? And it means just a psychological thing happening. Got nothing to do with anything uh, in the uh, broader than that. But occasionally Mara is used in the suttas to describe a kind of deity which tries to control uh, things, uh, yeah? 
Mara is supposed to be having reborn in what is called the Paranimitta Vasavati, and that is the realm of beings that like to control the creations of others. Uh, so these are kind of control freaks, control freaks in China. And Mara is the head control freak, yeah? so it's really especially bad. Uh, so this is, um, according to the suttas, Mara can then sometimes interfere in human, you know, in, in human things. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that that is a, is a se very secondary thing, uh, and that normally when we talk about Mara, what we actually mean is the psychological uh, issues that arise, that block you from accessing meditation. And whether there is, a, there, may v there probably are deities there, and sometimes they may interfere, uh, but uh, uh, you know, whether that really is important, or whether that matters or not, uh, I think it's largely irrelevant, uh, and it does not, uh, doesn't really have any much relevance as far as meditation and the spiritual path is concerned. Uh, yeah. Mara was a woman. <laughs> Male. M Mara is always male, yeah, yeah. I thought, I <laughs> yeah. Thought, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mara, so you're saying you thought Mara was a woman, yeah. Well, that's because uh, that's because very often that's how you talk about it, yeah. Because if you're a monk, you think, okay, you better be, had to be careful with uh, careful with women. So you so you think of women as Mara, but for the nuns, for the nuns especially, men are Mara. Yes, yeah? it's the exact opposite. Uh, but uh, it's true that the, the deity called Mara is always has to be male, yeah, according to the according to the suttas. Yeah, that's true. Control freaks. Yeah, May, that's what what happens. So. Okay. Anything else? Ajahn, yes, please. Uh, uh, Ajahn, could you explain on the Gaudika Sutta? Because when I read yeah. it, it's, it feels like to me like an arahant can commit suicide. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a nice sutta, isn't it? I, I'm very impressed. You read the suttas. Yeah, wow, well, I guess that's wonderful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's great. Oh, I heard, I, I heard yeah. a, a talk from another venerable. So he told me that Arahan can commit suicide. Yeah. So I searched and then I saw there is a sutta yeah. of this. Ah, okay, that's yeah. how you found, found it. Okay, yes. yeah. There is a few suttas like that. There's a Vakkali uh, Sutta, Godika Sutta, and uh, one more, three places at least, where it looks like an Arahant may have committed suicide. And I think that uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is one of the main translators into English, he agrees with that reading, that it actually looks like an Arahant committed suicide. So it seems like it, it could happen. Uh, and uh, the Buddha, in one place, he says that, well, if you do commit suicide as an Arahant, uh, basically, you, you know, it's okay, because you finished your job anyway, there's nothing more to do. So if you really have some unbearable unbearable pain or, or problem, something you, that is kind of difficult, uh, then it's not an issue. But if you're not an Arahant, it's worse because you have more work to be done. Yeah? So it's kind of too early, too early to commit suicide. Uh, it would be problematic. Yeah? So it looks like it may be, may be possible. And, it's quite, and it, that is very interesting because when you talk about ethics and what, is, uh, you know, what, is, what the five precepts are, for example, sometimes the question is, well, is suicide covered by the five precepts or not? Uh, now the Arahant is supposed to be perfect as far as the precepts is concerned. So if they can commit suicide, then maybe suicide is not covered by the five precepts. Uh, that's interesting. And uh, it may very well be the case because when, you, when we talk about killing, what we, are do what we mean by any kind of the, any of the precepts is that we are depriving someone else of something they want. If you steal from somebody, well, they, they presumably they want to have what you're stealing, uh, yeah? So you're taking from them something they want to have. Uh. If you kill someone, uh, it's only if they want to live uh, that you're actually taking something away from them that they, they don't want. So if you want to die, uh, and you have a good reason for it, and you want to commit suicide, uh, is it bad? Uh, it depends on what your motivation is, whether it's bad or not, uh, yeah? So from a Buddhist point of view, these things are actually quite uh, deep and quite complicated. It's not obvious that suicide is always wrong. If in certain conditions it is wrong, in other conditions it may not be wrong. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Please. If I were an Arahan, I wouldn't have thought, you know, to commit suicide. Well, there are different, kind of different kinds of Arahans. Some don't commit suicide, some do, yeah? So <laughs> you, you're the one that doesn't commit suicide. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
So there you are. It's interesting because this, that's what the sutta seems to be saying. Yeah, this is actually in there, and that's, that, that is fairly. That seems to be the message. So sometimes it kind of gives you new ways of looking at the dhamma. That's what's interesting about it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, everyone, so again, please have a nice night, have a good rest, and then uh, we'll see you back again tomorrow morning. And let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we go.